Welcome. This is the one year Bible reading for April 28th, and we begin today in Judges chapter 8, verse 18. And we are continuing this cycle of the Judges in which the Israelites turn away from the Lord and are oppressed. And they cry out to the Lord, and the Lord appoints a judge who delivers them from their oppressors, only to have them fall away again from worshiping the one true God. And so we have this happen even in Gideon's lifetime. They begin to turn away. Then Gideon asked Ziba and Zalmunna, The men you killed at Tabor, what were they like? Like you, they replied, they had the look of a king's son. They were my brothers, the sons of my own mother, Gideon exclaimed. As surely as the Lord lives, I wouldn't kill you if you hadn't killed them. Turning to Jether, his oldest son, he said, Kill them. But Jether did not draw his sword, for he was only a boy and was afraid. Then Ziba and Zalmunna said to Gideon, Be a man, kill us yourself. So Gideon killed them both and took the royal ornaments from the necks of their camels. Then the Israelites said to Gideon, Be our ruler. You and your son and your grandson will be our rulers, for you have rescued us from Midian. But Gideon replied, I will not rule over you, nor will my son. The Lord will rule over you. However, I do have one request, that each of you give me an earring from the plunder you collected from your fallen enemies. The enemies, being Ishmaelites, all wore gold earrings. Gladly, they replied. They spread out a cloak, and each one threw in a gold earring he had gathered from the plunder. The weight of the gold earrings was forty-three pounds. Not including the royal ornaments and pendants, the purple clothing worn by the kings of Midian, or the chains around the necks of their camels. Gideon made a sacred ephod from the gold and put it in Orpha, uh, Ophrah, his hometown. And this sacred ephod was not a bad thing. Actually, we've heard about ephods uh, before, haven't we? But unfortunately, soon all the Israelites prostituted themselves by worshiping it, and it became a trap for Gideon and his family. That is the story of how the people of Israel defeated Midian, which never recovered. Throughout the rest of Gideon's lifetime, about 40 years, there was peace in the land. Then Gideon, son of Joash, returned home. He had 70 sons born to him, for he had many wives. He also had a concubine in Shechem, who gave birth to a son whom he named Abimelech. Gideon died when he was very old, and he was buried in the grave of his father Joash at Ophrah in the land of the clan of Abizar. As soon as Gideon died, the Israelites prostituted themselves by worshiping the images of Baal, making Baal Bareth their god. They forgot their lord, their god, who had rescued them from all the enemies surrounding them. Nor did they show any loyalty to the family of Jeru Baal, that is, Gideon, despite all the good that he had done for Israel. One day Gideon's son Abimelech went to Shechem to visit his uncles, his mother's brothers. He said to them and to the rest of his mother's family, Ask the leading citizens of Shechem whether they want to be ruled by all seventy of Gideon's sons or by one man, and remember that I am your own flesh and blood. So Abimelech's uncles gave his message to all the citizens of Shechem on his behalf, and after listening to this proposal, the people of Shechem decided in favor of Abimelech because he was their relative. They gave him seventy silver coins from the temple of baal Bareth, which he used to hire some reckless troublemakers who agreed to follow him. He went to his father's home at Ophrah, and there on one stone they killed all seventy of his half-brothers, the sons of Gideon. But the youngest brother, Jotham, escaped and hid. Then all the leading citizens of Shechem and Beth Milo called a meeting under the oak beside the pillar at Shechem and made Abimelech their king. When Jotham heard about this, he climbed to the top of Mount Gerizim and shouted, Listen to me, citizens of Shechem. Listen to me if you want God to listen to you. Once upon a time the trees decided to choose a king. First they said to the olive tree, Be our king. But the olive tree refused, saying, Should I quit producing the olive oil that blesses both God and people, just to wave back and forth over the trees? Then they said to the fig tree, You be our king. 
But the fig tree also refused, saying, Should I quit producing my sweet fruit, just a wave back and forth over the trees? Then they said to the grapevine, You be our king. But the grapevine also refused, saying, Should I quit producing the wine that cheers both God and people, just a wave back and forth over the trees? Then all the trees finally turned to the thorn bush and said, Come, you be our king. And the thorn bush replied to the trees, If you truly want to make me your king, come and take shelter in my shade. If not, let fire come out from me and devour the cedars of Lebanon. Jotham continued, Now make sure you have acted honorably and in good faith by making Abimelech your king, and that you have done right by Gideon and all of his descendants. Have you treated him with the honor he deserves for all he accomplished? For he fought for you and risked his life when he rescued you from the Midianites. But today you have revolted against my father and his descendants, killing seventy sons on one stone. And you have chosen his slave woman's son, Abimelech, to be your king, just because he is your relative. If you have acted honorably and in good faith toward Gideon and his descendants today, then may you find joy in Abimelech, and may he find joy in you. But if you have not acted in good faith, then may fire come out from Abimelech and devour the leading citizens of Shechem and Beth Milo, and may fire come out from the citizens, uh, oh, and, and devour Abimelech. Then Jotham escaped and lived in Beer because he was afraid of his brother Abimelech. Luke 22, beginning in verse 44. And Jesus is on the cross. By this time it was about noon, and darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. The light from the sun was gone, and suddenly the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn down the middle. And I've reminded you before just how thick and immense this curtain was as the width of a man's hand um, and uh, took months and months to weave at that thickness. So this was a supernatural occurrence. Then Jesus shouted, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. And with those words, he breathed his last. When the Roman officer overseeing the execution saw what had happened, he worshipped God and said, Surely this man was innocent. And when all the crowd that came to see the crucifixion saw what had happened, they went home in deep sorrow. But Jesus' friends, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance, watching. Now, there was a good and righteous man named Joseph. He was a member of the Jewish High Council but he had not agreed with the decision and actions of the other religious leaders. He was from the town of Arimathea in Judea, and he was waiting for the kingdom of God to come. He went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Then he took the body down from the cross and wrapped it in a long sheet of linen cloth and laid it in a new tomb that had been carved out of rock. This was done late on Friday afternoon, the day of preparation, as the Sabbath was about to begin. As his body was taken away, the women from Galilee followed and saw the tomb where his body was placed. Then they went home and prepared spices and ointments to anoint his body. But by the time they were finished, the Sabbath had begun, so they rested as required by the law. But very early on Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. They found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. So they went in, but they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. As they stood there puzzled, two men suddenly appeared to them clothed in dazzling robes. The women were terrified and bowed with their faces to the ground. Then the men asked, Why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Remember what he told you back in Galilee that the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and that he would rise again on the third day. Then they remembered that he had said this. So they rushed back from the tomb to tell his eleven disciples and everyone else what had happened. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and several other women who told the apostles what had happened. But the story sounded like nonsense to the men, so they didn't believe it. However, Peter jumped up and ran to the tomb to look. Stooping, he peered in 
and saw the empty linen wrappings. Then he went home again, wondering what had happened. Psalm 99 The Lord is King. Let the nations tremble. He sits on his throne between the cherubim. Let the whole earth quake. The Lord sits in majesty in Jerusalem, exalted above all the nations. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Your name is holy. Mighty King, lover of justice, you have established fairness. You have acted with justice and righteousness throughout Israel. Exalt the Lord our God. Bow low before his feet, for he is holy. Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Samuel also called on his name. They cried to the Lord for help, and he answered them. He spoke to Israel from the pillar of cloud, and they followed the laws and decrees he gave them. O Lord our God, you answered them. You are a forgiving God to them, but you punished them when they went wrong. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain in Jerusalem, for the Lord our God is holy. Proverbs 14, 9 and 10 Fools make fun of guilt, but the godly acknowledge it and seek reconciliation. Each heart knows its own bitterness, and no one else can fully share its joy. And to end today, we are back with Selwyn Hughes. He's talking to us today about ostrich Christians from Proverbs 20, verse 27. The spirit of a man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all the inner depths of his heart. Most of us, myself included, are not good at observing ourselves and reflecting honestly on what goes on beneath the surface of our lives. Why is this so? I think one of the reasons is fear. Fear of the unknown. Fear of losing control. Fear of spoiling a comfortable existence. Or fear of having to face some unpleasant discoveries about ourselves. I have met many Christians in my time who adopt the attitude, however things are, good or bad, they could be worse so it is better to leave well enough alone. When we read the Bible, however, what do we find? We discover texts like the one before us today that show us God has designed us with the ability to explore our deepest parts. We also hear men like the psalmist crying out to God, Search me thoroughly, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there is any wicked or harmful way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. I want to stress once again that too much introspection is unhealthy, but occasionally and in proper doses, it is good medicine. Those who resist this and pretend everything is well when it isn't are what a friend of mine calls ostrich Christians. They have peace, but it is a peace built on unreality. When they lift their heads out of the sand, the peace they possess somehow falls to pieces. God's peace can keep our hearts and mind intact while we face whatever is true outside and inside. Father, save us from becoming ostrich Christians, people who pretend everything is well when it isn't. Nothing, dear Lord, must be allowed to hinder the work that you want to do in our hearts corner our souls and make us what you want us to be. Amen. Love you all. Have a wonderful day.